Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to another episode of Victorious Friday. You know, every time I come on, it's, it's almost like I'm saying the same thing. I have an amazing guest today, and well, today is no exception. I mean, with a good friend, uh, John Ramstead, and John and I go back. Uh, I remember just, man, a few years ago, we actually did a, a podcast together on his on his show, and uh, we I just enjoyed it so much. And I said, John, come on, man, we got to talk again. And so uh, uh, he's got some exciting things to talk about. We'll talk about his new book that's coming out in late April, uh, I think, and uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, his book and and on purpose with purpose and and John's life is all about purpose and so he's got some fantastic stories to share with us today. But today's topic that I want to home in on it ties into that is this idea of living a life of significance. What does that mean, right? John, welcome to the show. Oh, Darren, so great to be here. And thank you for what you're doing. You're, you know what? Your vision and everybody listening is, you know, of equipping generations to reach generations just yeah. helps us develop this mindset of, you know, every day as a parent, what we're doing with our kids and how we, yeah. you know, both love them and shape them and coach them and disciple them and mentor them is not just about our kids, but it's about what they're going to do, the people they're going to touch, their how they're going to raise their kids. And I love you taking that perspective and stretching it out because it really helps us, I believe, you know, make better decisions in the present. So I love what you're doing, brother. Thanks, brother. I love what you're doing as well. Let's jump into it, man. Give us a little bit of background on you. I mean, I know a little bit of it in terms of, man, you you were top gun out there. You were almost top gun, Navy pilot, you know, going out for that. And, and I know that story, uh, how that turned out, but tell us a little bit. And but you, you've done some amazing things, you know, leadership coach, uh, one of the best I've, I've seen and, and experienced and, you know, hosting your own podcast, things like that. But more importantly, father, husband, uh, beautiful kids. Uh, just give us a quick background on you, John, and you have so much rich uh, richness there. Uh, give us just a quick download of your backdrop uh, background. Yeah, quick background, you know, grew up in the church, but never really connected to like a personal relationship. So I went to college and kind of pulled the ripcord a little bit. Um, but I was there on a Navy ROTC scholarship um, back in the 80s when the movie Top Gun came out. Yeah. And so I'm like, I'm going to flight school. And then we heard, you know, hey, only one out of 10,000 people actually get a jet because this movie made everything so popular. Oh, my goodness. What did I get myself into? Um, but I, 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 we can talk about this later, but I went down, my dad gave me some amazing advice, which helped me just excel in flight school, ended up flying the F-14 Tomcat, the same movie in Top Gun, did combat, uh, cruises in Iraq, came back, like you said, yeah, I got orders to Top Gun, man, th this was hard because the next weekend after I got the, told that I was the one going, I was playing softball on a squadron team and I got drilled in the eye with the line drive and a blowout fracture nerve damage and a year later i lost my medical so a year later than i was out and man that, that was hard um i mean i was sitting there i got a job selling cell phones so i'm knocking on doors trying hoping somebody's home to sell them a phone so i can pay my bills and the sounds of my dreams are flying over my head back into miramar dude i was I was angry and bitter, but in that period of time, there was three men that came around me. I met one at a bookstore, believe it or not, Barnes and Noble, and they just started mentoring me. Yeah. And like John Maxwell says, right, you got to connect before you can pull. These guys really helped me kind of uh, figure out what I should do next and who I was and kind of rebuild an identity and a dream because it was all had been in the Navy. Um, it was also those three guys that led me to the Lord after they had been mentoring me for about six months. It was, it was amazing to just see how God works. But then um, I realized I didn't really like being an, uh, an employee. And so a friend of mine called me for a minute and said, so, Soda, I, I was in San Diego. And he said, hey, move back here. Let's start a company together. So that just started, uh, that didn't work out so well. I wasn't really ready to be a business partner. Uh, just being honest, I actually kind of drove that one into the ground. But uh, I uh, had just a long career doing technology startups, Fortune 100, rose to the management team, went to Wall Street, and then fast forward from 95 when I got out of the Navy 2011, um, I had an accident that put me in the hospital for two years. And honestly, that was like this inflection point that changed 
everything. There's almost like, you know, pre-accident and post-accident yeah. um, that really forced me to look and assess things. But the reason I got into coaching, Terrence, is after the accident, I, looked, I had a severe brain injury. I had had no income for two and a half years. I was in chronic pain. I couldn't go work. I could not support my family. And that's when I said, well, what I could do is maybe work with some leaders with my experience. And oh my gosh, it's absolutely been a, a wild ride, a blessing. And we've done some things I never expected at this point. So I've uh, been married 30 years, 31 years, actually. I have three boys. They're 23, um, 22, and 17. I have a wow. three-year-old grandson and a daughter-in-law. My oldest is married. So yeah, it's just an amazing family. Man, that's great, man. I, I tell you, it's I think about that accident. I read something around 23 surgeries later, man, and just going through. And I know you just uh, went through COVID as well. And, and, and I know you're still experiencing many side effects of that. Um, how has COVID kind of maybe changed the perspective of life or just have you think about things differently? What, what did you experience, my friend, real quick? I mean, just maybe share with the audience a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, before I got sick, you're looking at all the news and the data and the reports. And I knew some older people that have passed away. Um, but I knew for myself and my family, I, did, I figured if we got it, because my sister and my brother got it, and it was like a mild flu. So I was being careful and doing all, you know, following all the guidelines, but I wasn't worried. And then I got it. First three days, no problem. I'm like, yeah, it's gonna be just like my sister. Fourth day, I get a fever. Day 11, I'm at home in bed with a 105 degree fever wow. with chills so bad. I'm pulling muscles in my shoulder, my back, my legs. And then I woke up one morning and uh, I, it was really hard to breathe. Yeah. And, and I called my doctor and she said, just go straight to the emergency room. Hmm. And they did an x-ray and they, the, guy, the guy was really concerned because um, I had COVID pneumonia. Hmm. I had scarring in my lungs and they admitted me immediately to the ICU where, and I spent a week there. Yeah. And every day for the first, I think, four or five days, I got worse. Wow. They had to turn up the oxygen. They gave me every experimental treatment that they had. Mm -hmm. I could go through this whole list. It was The care I got was absolutely amazing. Um, during that period of time, though, you know, you can't see your family. Yeah. I got to talk to my boys and my wife, and I was trying to be as positive as I could, but I could barely speak. I would just say hello and, and be out of breath. And, you know, nine years ago, I almost died, right? And I, there, I know for a fact that this really, my, my, my kids were really worried they're going to lose their dad for real this time. And finally, the, that turned the corner. I was able to get out. It's now been six weeks since ICU. As you can see on the video, I'm still on oxygen. Yeah. It has definitely affected my lungs and my heart. But here's what I've learned, I think, is I saw, I think, the fear, um, anxiety, the worry, I think, you know, losing um, almost a sense of safety and security that my kids have experienced. And it yeah. made me really realize, Terrence, that because um, I talked to my son about it, who's 17, that actually kind of already existed because he knew some of his friends' parents um, who've really struggled and one passed away. I didn't even know about that. And I think something for us to be aware of as parents right now, we really need to probably have some meaningful conversations and sit down and talk about really how our kids are really doing. Because I think on the surface, they want to tell us everything's great. It's no big deal. I don't really know anybody. Um, but if you look at all the numbers of cutting, suicides, um, drug abuse, all these numbers are going up. You know, a lot of the schools are not open for whatever reason. You can have that whole debate, but the kids don't have some of the connections that have been healthy in the past, a lot of our kids. So as a parent, it really changed my perspective and brought it into focus. So I love that you're having this as a topic and it's something we really need to think about. Yeah. Oh man, that's so good. You know, I, I've been, uh, as we are now talking about vaccinations and so forth and, and to be quite candid first, you know, I'm thinking, oh, it's just, you know, this is just, uh, here we go, you know flu and minor thing we don't know what's happening you know let's get more information and and of course you know i'm i'm not on the list yet but now they're opening up and everyone can go in georgia and so forth uh 
And so I'm thinking, you know, do I get this vaccine? Do I report, you know, do I prioritize it? <laughs> How fast do I go out? Do I let some folks get it first and then I'll come and get, you know, see it, experiment on them and I'll, I'll come get it. But let me just encourage everyone, including myself, uh, and you have encouraged me today, uh, John, to make this a priority. And wherever you lie on the vaccine, I'm, I'm a, you know, wuss for needles and all this other stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, just just go. Uh, I'm talking to myself, in fact, to get the vaccine. Uh, they're safe. They're, they're amazing companies in Pfizer and J&J &J and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, if nothing else, protect yourself. But yes, protect your family and those loved ones around you. And um, not saying it's a fix all or be all who knows, but at least it's, it's another what I call hedge of protection that we can all partake in. And and, and if nothing happens, great, right? That's what we're looking for. Thank you so much, John, for sharing that piece of story. Hey, I want to jump into this, this topic, uh, leading people beyond influence. And, and you know, I, I, I thought about it. We can always take that from so many places. But you know what I like to start is leading people beyond influence. What about home, starting at home? and how you're leading as a father, as, as a husband. Uh, and then we'll get into, of course, that typical topic of, you know, best leaders that, you know, be the best leader you can be, be the best father you can be, the best husband you can be, the, be the best entrepreneur, or even the best podcast host, you know, that you can be. Take that topic and start with family and, and broaden it out where you, where you wanna go, John. Well, I'm, I'm smiling, Terrence, because you and I have done a lot of work in corporate America, yeah. worked with executives, leadership teams, small, medium, and ginormous. And I, I tell everybody I work with, uh, my clients, that my leadership lab is my kids. If I can have a positive influence on my kids, help them make better decisions, help them be better people, I know I can help your company. <laughs> and you and your team, because you know what? You're so close yeah, with yeah. the kids. You're so yeah. familiar. Um, and I really think that, you know, uh, I have come to realize I thought my biggest parenting job was to lay the foundation as they're growing up and get them through the teenage years and mm -hmm. the awkward years, those years when they're trying to be independent, and they really don't want to hear from dad. Mm -hmm. And as my kids have turned into adults, I realized the most important parenting years for me are not only right now, but they're ahead of me. Oh, that's they're going out in the world. They're making decisions that they're now going to have to live yeah. with yeah. the rest of their life, mm -hmm. their life partner, right? Their job, their lifestyle, just everything that they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and here's one thing that helped me, you know, as I got certified, I tend to, you know, being a military guy and having been an entrepreneur, my go-to mode was to be a bit directive, a little, you know, from a, from a leadership style, I was always really encouraging. I wanted to develop my people, but when a decision had to be made or something done, I, I tended to tell people what to do. And you know what? Uh, you can't do that with kids. So here, so I went through and got certified as a coach and I realized this skill of being able to really listen at a deep level. Yeah. To really try to seek understanding from their perspective. I might think my son is just nuts for, mm -hmm. or his reaction to like doing dishes, mm -hmm. right? It just feels ingrateful to me. So I would make an assumption about maybe a behavior and then we'd have a conversation. But what if I said, hey, yeah. what, what's behind that? Yeah. And I had to stop moving from this place of judgment to this place of curiosity about my boy, right? I have three boys. And just, uh, and so how do I ask better questions? How do I listen? How do I seek to understand their perspective? Now we still need to get to a certain outcome, yeah. right? They need to make good decisions. They have to get their homework done. But just as an example, my son came up to me and wanted to date somebody in, in high school, right? And he had dated somebody before and it had ended well. And we told him that's probably what's gonna happen. And I could have brought all that up to him, but I said, hey, let me ask you a question. This is your goal with baseball. You wanna make varsity early and you want to play a d1 baseball in college you saw how much time that it took when you had a girlfriend before how's that going to affect some of your goals i just 
through a series of questions and I never gave him any advice, he came to his own conclusion. So he owned this, yeah. that, you know what, I'm not going to date anybody. And from that day on, when things got clear, do you know, he's been working out twice a day for six days a week. That kid has transformed his body. Yeah. And I just love the fact that, you know, and it wasn't just me, but he had these dreams, but uh, the way that um, I approached the conversation allowed him to participate in it and own the outcome versus doing what dad told him to do, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And what I'm hoping is, right, you know, you talk about significance. My yeah. goal is to, you know, teach my kid, give them, the, you know, the knowledge that they need, mm -hmm. equip them, give them the experience to make better decisions. A lot of that's going to be through me asking questions for them to really, you know, think through things because they tend to be, you know, do quick decisions. Right. And give them the things they need in their environment to do the best yeah. that they can. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then is a, um, here's a, a not, well, go ahead. You, I think you had a, a question, but I was going to. No, no, that's that good. Story. My friend, go ahead and finish your thought. So, so here's something that's helped me as a dad. Um, I, I had the privilege, the joy to actually coach this gentleman who is a sports performance coach. Okay. So his clients were like LeBron James and Roy McElroy. And I mean, people at that level. Mm -hmm. And he was in, we were doing some work together on uh, some things he was working on, but my son was really struggling in baseball. This was about four years ago. And, and I said, Hey, Jamie, can you help me with my son? Because I keep telling him what to do, you know, you know, all the things, right. His stance, his attitude. And, and he goes, well, okay, let me ask you one question, John. When you, when your son walks off the field, what's, what do you ask him? I'm like, well, yeah. I say, how did you do? How'd you hit? You know, how'd you pitch? And he looks at me right in the eyes, turns. He goes, well, you're the problem. I'm like, what? What? I don't want to take responsibility for my son's bad attitude. He goes, yeah, you are forcing your son to compare himself to everybody else on the team. And comparing yourself to others is the biggest performance killer, whether you're an elite professional athlete or you're a 12-year-old. I'm like, wow. Now think about that. Our kids are almost they're encouraged they're asked to compare themselves through social media through what's in school through probably how we compare their grades to their brother or their sister um constantly and here's what jamie said he goes when he comes off the field just start asking them two things because this is what i do with every one of my clients the first one is could be the worst game he ever had he walked four pitchers in a row and they pulled them before he even threw a strike because that happened but i you know say ask him what did you do well well, you know, I hit good dad. And I, and I kind of got that behind me and played well at first base. Okay. And then the other thing he, he demand, Jamie, make sure his clients do is before they show up for their next meeting with him is they have to journal 10 things that they have learned, whether it's in a practice oh, wow. or a game or at home, mm -hmm. you know, since the last time they met, well, you can't do that with, <laughs> with a youngster. I asked him, you know, tell me 10 things. And he like yeah. brain locked. I'm like, how about one? <laughs> what happened was, so I said, okay. He goes, I don't know like he was upset. I said, well, next time you pitch, if it doesn't go the way you want, try to remember what's going on and maybe you can identify yourself. And he started doing that. He goes, here's why I keep missing low and left. At the end of the season, he, he absolutely transformed. At the end of the season, he was voted MVP by his team. And he saw in that, that he actually, these dreams that he had, there was actually, it was possible. And so I think if we help our kids not compare to others, but compete with the best version of themselves, and we have to make a choice often when they're having their bad day and we're having our bad day to look at them from that perspective of seeing that better version of themselves and speak from that place. Because I think our kids are going to rise to that bar that we are seeing with the words and the actions that we use and that we take. And in doing that, we can give our kids a self of self-worth and identity that was not given to me as a kid. It took me a lifetime to overcome some of the patterns that I didn't even know I had from how I was raised. Yeah. Everything was earned in my house. Yeah. A hug, and I love you, um, uh, a reward, it was earned. I think that's one of the reasons for me that it was so hard for me to connect any personal faith when I was younger, because I did not understand unconditional love. I imparted the nature of my parents under the nature of God, and I couldn't reconcile the two. 
I just said, hey, some of this stuff in the Bible, it might, it's for some people, but I'm not worthy. It's not me. And so I kind of went off on my own path. And I don't, it was unintentional, I'm sure, by my parents. They were doing the best that they could. Yeah. And I had to let some of those thoughts go too. Oh, John, that's that's a great story. You know, I I, I can connect, man. I was a pitcher growing up as well. And uh, first of all, the pressure you feel, feel as a pitcher, right? That's that's the right. one position along with the catcher. Every, you're involved with every play. And, uh, you know, like you say, if you can, you know, if you can think through that, but I love the idea of one, you wanted to connect with your son mm -hmm. at a different level uh, and to ask questions, right? I mean, any of us to do that in the marketplace or at home or what have you, uh, what an approach, my friend. I'm glad the Holy Spirit stepped in and said, hey, shut up, Terrence, listen, and let's let John tell the story, man. That's so powerful. <laughs> Hey, man, you have a significant project that you've been working on, uh, this amazing book that's coming out. I want to get some time on that because uh, we can, man, we can talk. We should schedule like five series on this and, and, and really start to talk. We could probably take multiple topics and, and have a great time with them. So we have to do this again, my friend. Oh, I, I would love to. Anytime I get yeah. to talk to you is a good day, yeah. man. Oh, man, it's a great day. And I, I want to jump to this project, man. Let me make sure I've got the, the title of the book correct. On Purpose with Purpose. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And yes. I think you're, I, I remember uh, late April, this, the, the book is coming out. Give us a little bit of, uh, make, you know, the topic when it's coming out. How can we get a copy? I mean, just, just jump in and then tell us a little bit about this project, man, this book, this labor of love, it's not your first, but hey, uh, it certainly is uh, the best. You know, John always says uh, the best book is the last one that I've written. <laughs> so so uh, I'm sure it's the case here, but tell us a little bit about On Purpose with Purpose. Yeah, so yeah, the book, thank you, Terrence. The, uh, you, if anybody's interested, you can go to beyondinfluence.com forward slash book, or you can just go to any bookseller. On after say that, April say that URL again. Beyond influence dot com okay. forward slash book. Okay, great. And it's on purpose with purpose. It's at all the booksellers. And this was a book that I dedicated to my wife and my boys. It's a this journey I had after my accident to step into the fullness of who I was created to be and do what had been prepared for me. And I got to tell you, you know, it says in, in John 10, 10, that, you know, I've, I've come to give you life so that you may live it to the full. I, Terrence, I was not even close to that before the accident. Um, so let me kind of paint a picture. Before September 2011, um, all of some of the habits and patterns, um, I, I had some anger issues. I was frustrated a lot and I, and I would, um, I didn't, I was not developing a great relationship with my boys. My marriage was a bit rocky. Um, I would, I'd never been working harder. I was, I'd started two nonprofits. I was volunteering at another one. I didn't have time to coach my kids sports teams, but I made sure I was at every game. Seriously. I, I never missed a game. And I literally, I might, I might've slept five or six hours a night. I felt like I'd created in my wife a stay-at-home mom and homeschooling at the time. And I felt like I created this lifestyle I don't get to participate in. And there were some months like we, you know, we were saved, some months we'd saved a lot and some months we were barely getting by. And it was just like this weird, this place. And I describe it as smoldering discontent. I knew this is not what I wanted at 45 years old. I had no idea how to get where I wanted to go with my, with my wife. I didn't want to admit that I was responsible for these results. That would have been too hard. And then the accident happens. And I was on a horse and this horse at a, uh, I got invited to a retreat with Dr. James Dobson for when he moved over to Family Talk. And I was the first one saddled and my horse just starts trotting and then bolts and takes off. And at a, and, and then just uh, in about 80 yards away, I couldn't get him to turn. I couldn't get him to stop. We're getting closer and closer. We're at a full speed. And about just in front of the fence, I remember everything slowing down. And I remember thinking, this is not going to end well. And that's the last thing I remember. The horse goes into the fence and he bucks so hard, he flipped over. And he launched me Superman into the top steel beam. 
and I crushed the left side of my skull. I broke every bone in my skull virtually, except for my jaw and my right cheekbone. I broke my neck. I shattered my shoulder. Uh, one of the other bars hit me in the chest and I crushed the left side of my rib cage and one of the broken ribs punctured my left lung. And now we found out later from multiple doctors what happened to me, mostly because of the brain injury was so severe, it was not survivable. And best case scenario, because I broke my neck at C2 and I believe C4, I should have been like Christopher Reeves, best case. And I wake up on the ground into more pain than I could ever describe to anybody. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in God's presence. He's standing next to me. And he takes away all the pain that I'm in. This love, this, it was like it had a physical weight to it. As soon as I felt it, I had one thought. And that is, I am not worthy of somebody loving me like this. I mean, I didn't even know how bad my body was crushed. And then he spoke to me and there's a voice that came from everywhere and nowhere. And it was, you know, he, first thing he said was all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. And then he said, John, I'm going to heal you. Use this for my glory. And he said, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he said it like that, kind of like, you know, fun. it wasn't like stern. Because I remember, because as soon as he said that, I knew for a fact that my left eye was permanently blind. All the bones behind the eye socket shattered, severed the optic nerve. And a friend of mine said later, he goes, God blinded you so you could see clearly. I'm like, well, maybe I, you know, I'm, I'm working on seeing completely clearly, not like half clearly. But anyway, um, so here's what happened is I'm in the hospital. This is now a couple of days later. My kids have come and visited me. And then the brain swells really slowly. And it got really bad. Neurosurgeon comes in and says, we got to do a brain surgery. We got to take John's whole skull off and like fix everything. And this is really risky. And the chances of being the person you remember are very low. And he asked my wife who was sitting there, the only other person in the room, do I have a will? And more importantly, does John have a living will? I was like, oh boy, I got real. And my wife's like, well, we were, <laughs> we just redid this. He was supposed to sign it after this trip. And the doctor says, listen, we can wait until the morning, but no longer will you call the attorney and have it FedExed up here. And they both left the room. I'm like, what? So I'm sitting there in the room, even though I had this encounter with God, Terrence, I was convinced of one thing that the next weekend was my funeral. And I started thinking about, I started playing the tape. And at first it felt pretty good because, you know, everybody says nice stuff at the front of the church. And that's what you do. Then I started thinking, what would they really say at the back of the church? you know, when they're all rooting around for the fried chicken and potato salad. And what would they all say to me a year, about me a year or two later? And I got to tell you, I was really convicted. And I started thinking of two things. The first thought that hit my head, are, are they going to be okay? You know, life insurance, savings, investments, things like that. Did I leave them in a good place? So I started thinking of inheritance. And that is what you leave to somebody. And I realized, you know what, they're, they'll be okay. Then I started thinking, though, of, a, of legacy. And I said, what if I left in my wife? What if I left in John and Michael and Matthew, my boys? Have I lived a life that would outlive my life through my boys' lives? And I realized, I don't think so. If I dwell on it too long, man, I get emotional. And God gave me this amazing second chance to be better, to be gooder. And I realized I want to dedicate my life to being, because you know, all of us, if we think about it, think about that one man, that one woman, a coach, a parent, a teacher, a mentor that came into your life, saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself, challenged you when you didn't want to maybe take that next step forward, helped you get through situations that you thought you would never survive. And it's who, why you are the person you are today. I wanted to be that to others because I had so many people in my life and I realized that's not, my operation was kind of all about me. And what I realized is I, I didn't understand it, but every day before that accident, every morning when I woke up was a second chance. Not only did I not understand that I had that ability to rewrite my script, but I just let it pass me by. And here's, that's the good news tomorrow for everybody. If you don't like where you're at today, my relationship with my kids and my wife was not good today. 
it is, it has never been stronger. COVID to us, where we've come in the last nine years, all three of my kids, my daughter-in-law, my grandson, my wife, for five months, we were all under my roof. Every day was amazing. There was no argument, no strife. So here's what I realized through that. Um, as I recovered, it was long. It was, you know, and then I was five weeks in ICU and then 20 months at a specialty hospital with a severe traumatic brain injury, 23 surgeries, like you talked about. I had some serious um, um, <laughs> brain damage, like for real, Dane Bramage. Uh, I had no emotional control. I would scream and yell and swear at my kids. So as my body was healing, my brain was behind that. And it caused, as I think, much damage to my relationships with my kids, who I was as I recovered, as, as what happened to me physically. I mean, it was, it, it was hard. Man. God said he was going to heal me. He also did not heal me the way that I was expecting. Right. I texted people, Terrence, like I had a huge meeting with yeah. potentially one of our biggest new clients two weeks after this accident. I texted my business partner and I said, hey, don't cancel the meeting. I'll be there. I'll be good. I'm good to go. I didn't know I was going to be in the hospital for two more years. Man. Okay. So, I mean, think about just processing all this. Yeah. Here's what I found going through all this and in, in, in figuring out, and I'm like, okay, I want to have this amazing relationship. So here's one of the things for me mm -hmm. that was really helpful mm -hmm. and it wasn't easy. And it took a long time. One of the most worthwhile exercises I've ever done. I wrote that obituary that I wanted my wife to say. Yeah. And I wrote one, for John and Michael and Matthew and other people that were very close to me. And I've never shared it with him, Terrence. I've shared it with some very close friends. Yeah. I know you have a close circle. And here's the other thing too, is that especially guys that I talk to. Yeah. Women, I think are a little better at this, but we need to have people in our life that are just wingmen Absolutely. that are there with us that we're doing life together yes. with and, yeah. and I've handed it to him and I said I want you know would you be willing to read this and then hold me accountable to live a life so that mm -hmm. Donna someday will say I always felt like the most loved woman in the world that yeah, my son John, that they're all different yeah I love that this. example John yeah and here was the key to all of that before this, I think the reason I was such in a place of such discontent and misery is that everything out of my life was out of alignment, but I didn't know it because mm. I had never understood really who I was. It was almost like the my son on the baseball field. There was a big difference between how he was showing up and that best version of himself. Remember, we want to help compete between who we are now and that best version of ourselves. What is that best version of ourselves? And I asked my coach one day, I said, man, I got to figure out how I'm wired. This is coming out of this whole mess, this accident. I couldn't work. I could work eight to 10 hours a week after two and a half years. I was in chronic pain. I had literally, I've been wiped out financially. And I had to figure out what's next. And before this, that whole notion of purpose and calling and all, and like what I should be doing, my assignment was like this buried treasure. And I couldn't find it. And I wasn't equipped. I wasn't worthy. I didn't have the right tools. All this stuff was in my head. And I realized... God showed me I've been going about it backwards. Because I asked Jeff, I said, I got to figure out how I'm wired. And then I can figure out what I'm wired for. Yeah. And Jeff yeah. goes, maybe you should ask yourself that question a little differently. He goes, why don't you ask yourself how God wired you? And what did he wire you for? Well, that's and good. I got to tell Terrence, for me, that was like, might sound subtle. Mm -hmm. But it was this huge shift of yeah. this this awareness yeah. that everything I had in life at that moment was of my making mm. and a huge step for me personally as a father and a husband and in business and in life was to take responsibility for how I think the emotions that I have in any given situation and the actions that I take. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about on purpose with purpose with John Ramstead. John, I tell you, that's powerful. As we wrap up, man, I tell you, we've, we've got to schedule like three or four more sessions on this, but <laughs> okay. as we wrap up, give us, look in that camera, my friend, and 
And think about those parents out there. Think about on purpose, with purpose. Think about your life, living a life of significance. And give us one parting uh, word that would just encourage us, encourage those parents today. Small steps. When I looked at how, how big the gap was between the father I was and wanted to be, between who I was and that best version of myself. The, the, that's the reason I wrote the book to my kids so they could become that best version of themselves. Everything I went through is outlined in there. It's the framework of how I work with my clients and do my coaching. And the one thing that I believe allowed me to move forward, because if I thought about how big the gap was, it was overwhelming. And I had to bring everything into the present and say, okay, what is the one small step I can work on today? Maybe it's when my wife gets frustrated with me because that was her habit, mostly because of how I was showing up. I was not going to respond with a little quip or sarcasm. That was actually a big step some days, Terrence. And I said, okay. And then also, um, and this became, this has become a family motto that excellence is the standard, but grace oh. is the word. Wow. I'm going to have a standard of excellence in how I treat people and love unconditionally, but I know I'm going to mess up and it is going to be frustrating for me and others. And we need to have a spirit of grace. We're going to forgive each other when we mess up because we're all trying to get better, but I need to lead the way. Cause if I can get a little bit better, I can help my son be better. Cause I figured out how to do it for myself. Well, that's why I become I wanna... a little bit better. My wife will maybe want to. Yeah, that's so good, John. That's why I want to stop right there, man. Give me that quote one more time. Excellence. Excellence is the standard. Yes. But grace is the word. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. Another section of session of Victorious Friday. Good friend John Ramsey. Remember, his new book is coming out on purpose, with purpose. Uh, give me the date, John, and also Comes give me the URL. Mm -hmm. April 27th, beyondinfluence.com forward slash book. My, my uh, vision is to create a movement where we just become better versions of ourselves, have amazing families mm -hmm. and relationships with our kids and at work and all the stuff that we're seeing out in society. I believe it can be solved in the next couple of years when all of us just become a little bit gooder, Terrence. Mm -hmm. Well, for excellent information and, and topics like living a life of significance, as we just share here today, you can also visit us at victorious, I-O-U-S, victoriousfamily.org. Thank you, John, for this time. Loved it, man. And um, hey, God bless, blessings to you. Uh, stay strong and keep living a life of significance. Thanks, man. Keep doing what you're doing. It is, it's awesome. Uh, Thanks, I love brother. the mission you're on. Appreciate you.